It's time for another episode of Corner of the Galaxy from the Box. To behind the scenes of the LA Galaxy and into the minds of soccer reporters and MLS experts. Your hosts for the day are Corner of the Galaxy's Josh Guessman and LA Times soccer reporter Kevin Baxter. Let's start the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Corner of the Galaxy from the Box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Coming to you on Monday, September 16th, the LA Galaxy coming off a 7-2 victory over Sporting Kansas City. Most goals scored since 1998 for the Galaxy. The big blowout win everybody, I guess, was finally looking for. Uh, the Galaxy put a big hurt on Sporting Kansas City. Zlatan Ibrahimovic sets Galaxy history. Uh, so lots of uh, fun, interesting details to talk about this LA Galaxy. Do we even believe that this LA Galaxy that scored seven goals is the Galaxy that now can head towards the playoffs and an easier schedule? So a lot of things we need to discuss, and in order to help me do that, is uh, the man, the myth, the legend. It is Mr. Kevin Baxter. Kev, how's it going, buddy? All right, how are you? Hey, did you hear Zlatan won Player of the Week? I, I could, can, you, can you believe it? That must have been a close vote. I was gonna, I was gonna a say million to nothing, probably. Yeah, I was gonna say we, leave, uh, you know, every once in a while we get one right, Kev. Okay, you know, it was, it was one of those guesses that it was like, oh, maybe, maybe Zlatan will actually be Player of the Week. Yeah, he is. I mean, uh, three goals and a, and a hat trick, uh, a, a bunch of, uh, a bunch of highlight worthy, you know, goals and uh, and you know everybody getting on the scoreboard. I mean. Uh, I'm trying to think. This has to be the most complete victory for the LA Galaxy, although I'm not completely convinced uh, that it was a great game from the LA Galaxy. They just seemed to score a lot of goals. Well, it, after, I'm, you know, I'm not so sure it was the most complete victory because when you talk about the way they won, I mean, it was a, I, yes, Sebastian had his first multi goal game in MLS. That was great. Joe Corona scored his first goal. But once again, it was all Zalatan. And he said afterward, you know, I go back and forth over whether I really like Zlatan and really want him to stay or whether I'm kind of tired of the act and want him to move on. Regardless of that, there is no doubt that, as he said, less than after the game, he said, I am the best ever to play in MLS, and that's without joking. And you know what? That's, like, really over the top, but he's absolutely right. Uh, you can break down. He's already third. It's his all-time scoring list. This is a legacy franchise, an original MLS franchise, only Landon Donovan and Robbie Keane have scored more goals in a Galaxy uniform than Zlatan, and he hasn't even played two full seasons yet. Uh, he, No one can dominate a game. I've never seen anyone dominate a game in any sport the way that he can. Yeah, okay, so he was invisible in the Colorado game two weeks ago, but and that happens from time to time. But, you know, he's had four multi-goal games in his last six games. It's just incredible. When he steps up and wants to take over a game, he takes over a game. He's like the he's like the big – we've said this before. He's like the big kid on your Little League ki uh, team who's already shaving. Um, it, you just can't get him out. I mean, he's the best uh, player in MLS. I agree with him. Best player in MLS history. And, I, you know, as we said earlier, I get sometimes I, I'm not sure whether I like him or, or don't. I get tired of the act on the field sometimes, the way he, he sometimes puts down teammates and stuff. But then today he holds a party at his house to celebrate the victory yesterday and invites the whole team over. I mean, that's the kind of team leadership, team bonding thing that you definitely need on a team like this that was so many players coming in during the season. You know, some of these guys are still kind of getting to know each other a little bit. And an event like this, the day after a big win – Man, this even more than the win, this party today at Slatan's house on Monday, it really could go a long way until it, to getting this team into the playoffs. Yeah, yeah, it could, and and you know, I think there were some people who were like, oh, they're celebrating a a fifth place, you know, uh, standings, and I'm like, you know, it, it's always nice to see that people can put things into perspective. These guys under pressure here in the last couple of weeks, results not going their way. Uh, I would say that in some cases, referee calls not going that way. We'll talk about the the ones that came up in this game, and then you know, also mentioning the ones in Colorado, which we covered pretty extensively on Thursday night. Um, so, you know, all these things have sort of all these pressures and to go out and have sort of, you know, a let off some steam game, uh, a seven to two game scoring seven goals. Zlatan gets outscored by four uh, by uh, three other L.A. Galaxy players combined uh, in this particular game. You know, two from Sebastian Legette and one from Joe Corona, his first L.A. Galaxy goal. Uh, Uriel Antuna is now the second uh, in second place in Galaxy goal scoring. I was going to uh, joke around with uh, Uriel after the, after the game. I was going to ask him this. We ran out of time. I was going to be like, you know, so, uh, you know, you scored, uh, you're now in second place in goal scoring. You think you can chase down Zlatan. Uh, you know, only 22 goals behind him. 
Um, but this is this was a uh, a game that the Galaxy needed. It was a confidence building game, and it was a game that two things I think I have to remind everybody about. Kevin is one, Sporting Kansas City scored first, and two, the game was one one at halftime, um, which everybody seems to sort of gloss over. The Galaxy scored six goals uh, in the oh. second half. On seven shots on goal. On seven shots, they as as Guillermo said after the game, and he was correct. Uh, he said, you know, basically, uh, he was saying efficiency. Uh, we were efficient tonight. We were efficient. Sometimes we can't be this efficient. Sometimes things don't work out the way they are. But tonight we were efficient because I sort of asked him the difference between, okay, so why was tonight different than all the other nights? What was different with the team? And he, you know, basically it came down to the efficiency argument. He says, you know, and it's so much more than that because. Uh, when you look at what the Galaxy were able to do with Christian Pavone, who might be my player of the match if it wasn't for Zlatan Ibrahimovic scoring three goals and setting Galaxy history, um, you know, Christian Pavone, who didn't have a goal but had an assist, um, I think on the night, uh, Pavone was absolutely electric with his runs. Uh, Uriel Antuna was running into space that you haven't seen him run into uh, that led to, you know, a penalty kick goal um, for Zlatan Ibrahimovic in his first. There were just so many good things. Sebastian Lejet getting two goals, but not just getting two goals, getting forward, getting into the attack. Jonathan Dos Santos with some just ridiculous passing. I think he missed one pass all night. I think he missed one pass all night, and you're talking about a central defensive midfielder who was on the ball for a ton of this time. Um, so, I mean, this is this is where you, you look at all of his different things. He had a 98.6% passing accuracy um, and totally, totals, uh, total of 69 passes. I mean, just all of these performances combined, Kevin, um, all of these things sort of, you know, going the way. And, and the fact is that Guillermo Barrescoloto went with a lineup that was changed and different from other lineups that we've seen, starting Dave Romney out at left back for Jorgen Shelvick. Uh, you know, Diego Polenta returning from suspension, moving into the center with Dan Steris and, and People Gonzalez going back to the bench, something some people have been asking for. Um, and then you had Rolf Felcher out on the right-hand side, Legette and Jonathan Dos Santos and Joe Corona in the midfield. And, and people remember that midfield from earlier in the season before Fav Fabio Alvarez joined. And with Fabio Alvarez now injured, um, something we can talk a little bit about, the Galaxy, you know, offense looked look solid and looked cohesive and quick passing and a lot of combinations, especially in that second half. Maybe not so much in the first half, but in the second half um, with Legette with Corona and with Jonathan Dos Santos. So, I mean, you know, you look across this and there's a lot of, you know, sort of five-star performances from players. And having said all that, it felt like Sporting Kansas City probably left three or four goals out there on some of the chances that they had and missed. So, um, you know, in terms of my overall sort of thinking of this match, it was one the Galaxy needed in terms of running up the score. Um, I think they get some confidence behind the defensive play that they were able to sort of put in front, but there's still issues with this team. This isn't a, you know, oh, everything's great now, um, but this this helps. This certainly didn't hurt. Well, you know I love stats, yes. so I'm going to give you a whole bunch of stats in today's show. I'll try to break them up a little bit because they'll get really boring, but you're right. Um, there are some faults in this team. Uh, you know, they have a, uh, Dave Bingham has faced more shots on goal and made more saves than any goalkeeper in MLS, and that shows the ball's getting through. Um, you know, teams teams nowadays, they want to dominate possession. They want to dominate shots. And, and if the Galaxy are giving up that many shots, not, not to mention just the goals, the 49, what is it, 49 goals now they've given up, it, the shots on goal, that means the Galaxy don't have the ball. But the real test will come next week against Montreal. That's a game the Galaxy should win. It's at home against a team that's struggling a little bit, about to fall out of the playoff picture. But the Galaxy have not won consecutive games since mid-April. So as good as yesterday was... It's just one game. You only get three points for it. They got to come back and do it again. You talked about uh, yesterday. I think you said you thought it would take nine points in their last five games to get into the playoffs. I think that's a little bit low. I think they're probably going to need a little bit more than that. But if you're right, they've got the three points. They need six from their last four. And when you look at who they play, I think probably the last two, Vancouver, Houston, they should get those two. I think Real Salt Lake there is going to be tough. This Montreal game looms as the one that may make the difference. I actually think you said ninety, uh, you said nine points. I think that would have got to get them to what fifty one, fifty two. Yeah, yeah, something I right about. Yep. I think they need a little bit more than that. I think they need to be more closer into the mid fifties. But in any case, you and you mentioned Giancarlo uh, Gonzalez as well. You know, since he's come here, he's played in eighteen games. The Galaxy have lost half of those games. They're five, nine, and four in the games that Giancarlo. Uh, Gonzalez has played in and I think it's uh, 
kind of significant that he wasn't in the lineup, didn't play at all yesterday. But then you mentioned Pavone. Sometimes these numbers get a little screwy. You have to look at who they played, when they played, who else was on the field. Because you look at the, the Giancarlo Gonzalez numbers and you say, okay, they've won five of his 18 games. They lost half of them. Not really making a contribution. Maybe the, the, something about him uh, um, it, you know, makes the team play in a different style. But then you look at Pavone. We could all agree Pavone's been a great addition. He's already second on the team in assists. No, he leads the team in assists with five. Yeah, yeah, no, he's he leads tied. the team in assists. He's played seven games. Yep. The, the team's only – the team is two, three, and two. They've lost three of the, the – they've only won two of the seven. They've lost three of them. Yet he's he leads the team in assists already. And you look at what does he do to make – uh, players better well he's got the one goal and the five assists you look at Zalatan has nine goals in his seven games in Pavon's seven games he's gone scoreless once in those seven games so when you look at the one loss number sometimes that doesn't really tell you what's going on because it, clearly we can look at Pavon's stats uh, aside from the one loss one and and his chemistry with Zalatan and say this guy is a real difference maker. Yeah, I, I, you know, to, to continue your stats trend, I was doing something uh, sort of talking about Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Uh, Michael had, had tweeted at me and said, you know, with four games remaining, do you think Zlatan can pass Vela in goals and break the goal record of 31, which is which was set by Martinez? Was it 31 um, or is it 34? Yeah, no, it's 31. Okay, it's 31. Okay, just making sure. Uh, 31, which was set by Martinez. And I said, you know, I, I, my, my direct response was, I find it bet, it's best not to question what Zlatan is capable of in terms of you, if you can think of it, Zlatan can do it. Um, and so I said, you know, last night was his 14th multi-goal game in MLS. So 14 times he's scored two goals or more. It's his third Galaxy hat trick. It's his second hat trick this season. Uh, in the last 10 games he scored, he has two hat tricks, 10 goals, and had five multi-goal games. Um, this is a guy who is absolutely capable of any numbers you can put him up there. Uh, with the 26 goals, which is an LA Galaxy single-season goal-scoring record, he passed Carlos Ruiz, who scored 24 goals in 26 games in 2002, something we've been tracking the whole time. Again, Carlos Ruiz had uh, was averaging .92 goals per game, or one goal every 99 minutes. Right now, through 25 games played, so one less than Carlos Ruiz, Zlatan Ibrahimovic has two more goals um, with 26 goals, 25 games played. He's averaging 1.04 goals per game, so over a goal a game right now, and that means that he's basically scoring one goal every 87 minutes. It's just not something... It, Carlos Ruiz is on this. Zlatan of last year is on this. Edward Hurtado, Robbie Keane, Landon Donovan. I mean, you're talking about the absolute upper echelon of LA Galaxy players, and Zlatan Ibrahimovic, by these numbers right here, and what they're sort of showing, uh, shows him head and shoulders above everybody else. At 37. At 37. As uh, So so this is a little, uh, little fun tidbit. So uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic uh, was in the locker room after the game. Uh, he was uh, he had just come out of the shower. He was you know fixing his ponytail, which sometimes he does two or three times, by the way, just to get it right. Make sure sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. Doesn't you know it depends on where he's going with it. So he's doing that. He comes in, he talks to us, he gives us some some great quotes. All that was fun. Um, somebody asked him if he was basically you know the best in the MLS, and I think everybody's seen the quote. He goes, you know, I think I am the best in MLS, and I'm not joking. Uh, I think I'm you know basically the best uh, best that's ever been in MLS, and, I, and I'm not joking. So that was his general sort of uh, demeanor as he was doing it. He was in a great mood, and he had a lot of really good sort of insight into you know breaking the record. And, and as he said, I'm, I didn't come here for vacation. Um, you know, just some really good stuff. So then he goes and he leaves, and it's sort of left on a little bit of a weird you know interaction with another reporter. But Jovan Karofsky walks in um, there, and he goes he and and uh, Zlatan yells out to Jovan. He goes, Jovan. He goes, he goes. They're asking me if I'm the best in MLS. Of course, I'm the best in MLS. He goes, and I'm 38. He goes, imagine if I was 28. Right. And so it was the whole thing was just this this. Yeah. Remember all these guys who are supposedly in their prime uh, who are in this league, you know, doing the thing. Zlatan is is, you know, almost 38. He'll be 38, I think, on October 3rd uh, is when his birthday is. So he's almost 38 and he's out there, uh, you know, doing this and, and absolutely bossing games around. I mean, the poor Graham Smith, the defender. 
uh, was just just you know obliterated by Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Uh, you know Gutierrez was obliter- obliterated by Zlatan Ibrahimovic. I mean, Sporting Kansas City had no answers for the LA Galaxy. The fact that they had uh, goals from Sebastian Legette, they got two, and Joe Corona who had one, and Ariel Antuna had one, was really the result of uh, of Zlatan Ibrahimovic drawing sometimes two and three defenders whenever the ball would get put in the box, and other guys would be uh, open for that as well. So I mean, there's just there's absolutely no way that you could count Zlatan Ibrahimovic out from setting an all-time MLS goal-scoring record. Uh, And there's also no way that you could count him out from possibly even uh, tracking down Carlos Vela, who has 28 goals right now, just two in front of Zlatan Ibrahimovic. I think Zlatan's played uh, one or two less games as well. So uh, it's very... Very interesting in terms of what motivates Zlatan and what could possibly help uh, push them towards those playoffs. Well, do you want some more numbers? Yeah, let's do it. Let's just throw them all together, right? We put all these numbers together. They're all Zlatan numbers because when you look at them, they just go wild. We know that Zlatan is is one of only three active players with more than 500 goals for club and country. The other two are Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo. You may have heard of at least one of those two. But uh, of the nine clubs that Zlatan's played for, he already has more goals, um, or as many goals. He has 48, right, in 52 games. 48 goals in 52 games. At Malmo, he had 18 goals in 47 games. At Ajax in the Netherlands, he had 48 goals in 110 games. He's already matched that in half the games, less than half the games. At Juventus, he had 26 goals in 92 games. Inter Milan, 66 goals in 117 games, so more goals there. Barcelona, 22 goals in 46 games. He, already with the Galaxy, he has more than twice the number of goals in six more games. Uh, AC Milan, he had 56 goals in 85 games. Paris Saint-Germain, 156 goals in 180 games. That's the closest he gets, I think, to being uh, the, the kind of ratio he has with the Galaxy. It's still way off. Then at Man United, 29 goals in 53 games. The Galaxy, 48 goals in 52 games. So at the end of his career, granted that combina- the, 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 the level of talent in MLS is a little bit different than it's going to be in Syria. Ah, right. Um, but uh, d- d- the production at this age, it's incredible. And I have to say, you know, we talked about before, we go back and forth on, as I have, so a lot of time should stay. He's, he's contributing. He's the best player in, in league history. They need to bring him back. And then at other times I'll say, no, $7.2 million. It's clear that that Guillermo Barascoloto wants to do something else with that money. He's really rebuilding the team. He wants to play in a different high pressing style that Zalatan doesn't fit. Maybe he should move on. Um, I keep going back and forth. And the great thing is, is I can go back and forth. I can change my mind. Dennis DeClosa and Guillermo, they get to make the decision once. They they don't get a, a, a mulligan. They make the decision once and Zalatan either stays or goes. When I see the he already has with Pavon, when I see the way he takes over a game, yeah, this is not the way Guillermo wants to play. This is not his dream attack, and the team is going to struggle, and the team is going to be inconsistent because the team doesn't really have a culture or a personality. They're, they're kind of a mishmash of a number of different styles. Guillermo's bringing in guys to play his style because at some point Zalatan is going to retire, maybe in 20 years, but at some point Zalatan will retire and, Zalat- and Guillermo is going to play his style of game. But when you look at the way Zlatan dominates, the way he can just take over a game, now it seems like, and especially the way there's that chemistry with Pavon. Pavon was brought in, brought in, I think, to be the star. I think he realizes that right now he's he's sort of the sidekick, and he's happy to play that, and he seems to be doing very well in that role. So you know, now it, it seemed it would be ridiculous to, to get rid of Zlatan, no matter how much money he cost. And I say all that to tell you that this has, I don't think, been reported anywhere before. Last week, I went out to training, and afterwards, I, I was going to go talk to Dennis DeClosa, and he was at a 45-minute closed-door meeting with Zlatan. And I don't know what they were talking about. Um, I was told it was a normal meeting that he meets with all the players on a regular basis. You know, my guess is that uh, um, uh, Quayle probably doesn't go in and spend 45 minutes at the door closed the general manager. This was Zlatan. What they were talking about, nobody knows. Uh, that's why the door was closed. What they were talking about next year, uh, Zlatan's agent wasn't there, but he could have been on a conference call. Whether they were just talking about what movies they've seen lately and, and, and liked, I, I don't know. But it was a long meeting. It was appeared to be quite serious. And uh, maybe that'll bode well for the future. Yeah, yeah, it could be. You know, it, it's it's tough to put into to terms whether or not, you know, in Major League Soccer, uh, the highest paid player in Major League Soccer is Zlatan Ibrahimovic at $7.2 million per year. Um, 
but it, it's hard to sit here and say that it's not worth it, right? Because certainly off the field, on the field, all that combined, and, and with 26 goals, 26 goals, with 26 goals in 2019, he is now, as of as of playing 30 games, the LA Galaxy are paying him basically $230,769 per goal. Um, which, by the way, if you take your $7.2 million and sort of divide that all, all around, it's actually uh, you have to go to 30 games first and then do it if you want to do it correctly. That's why if you just divide 7.2 by 26, you won't get $230,000. Um, but if you're looking at it right now through 30 games, they're paying him two hundred. So far, they've paid him $230,000 per goal. That doesn't seem like that's a ridiculous amount of money. Uh, whenever you realize what he has provided both on the field, off the field, and everything else sort of in between. We, we've also joked about, you know, sort of how much do you pay him per game. And this year, uh, per game, he's $288,000 per game. Whereas Roman Alessandrini, who only who makes just shy of $2 million per year, is currently costing the LA Galaxy $400,000 per game. Um, so, you know, a bunch of those different things, looking at those and, and trying to figure those out is, is, you know, you're trying to assess the value that you're getting from Zlatan Ibrahimovic. And I don't know if there's a more valuable player in terms of what he's making, what he's producing and what he gives you both on the field and off the field. I don't know if there's a more valuable one in Major League Soccer. And I would say there probably isn't. And he's the highest paid player in Major League Soccer. Well, and here's why why you're right because the Galaxy have the second highest payroll with a base pa- salary of 17.7 million dollars this year. Only Toronto has a higher base salary payroll, um, and when you know seven seven million of that goes to Zlatan, so he's taken up what you know more than a third of it, right? So um, yeah, he but, but so so obviously he's taken up the most of the salary. You would think he would be the most viable guy, and he is. But here here's really my point is. The Galaxy missed the playoffs two years in a row, including one season with Zlatan there, um, and they're paying all that money, and the playoff field has expanded. More than half the teams in MLS get in the playoffs this year. Twelve teams in the Western Conference, seven of them will make, will make the playoffs. The Galaxy aren't in there yet. They're not guaranteed a playoff spot. If they don't make it with the second-highest payroll in the league, and they don't make it two years in a row with the best, but the self-described best player in league history, and I, I defy anyone to argue with him right now. If they don't make it, that is hugely embarrassing, and that is a real red mark against the team. So there is a lot of pressure here, uh, and, and I agree with you about Zlatan. When, when you look at what he's done down the stretch, nine goals in the last seven games, um, I think you know, there is a real argument to be made for the most viable player, especially if he continues. If he continues and gets the Galaxy into the playoffs, I think it's a no-brainer. Uh, Carlos Vela has really dominated that conversation all along, and we saw what happened. He missed two games with the hamstring, and, and uh, LAFC did not win either game. But they have a lot of other weapons. And, and as valuable as he's been, and, and Carlos Vela's season has been tremendous, and and he would be a very, very uh, deserving winner of the MVP award with, when you look at what he's done with assists and goals and being captain and the way LAFC plays and how important he is to that. But it would be hard. And, and the Galaxy, you know, they're in fifth place. They're fighting for a playoff spot. They're not going to win the su- supporter shield like LAFC is. So it's a kind of a different argument. But when you look at it the way you just did and say, where would they be without Zlatan? Yeah. Um, they'd be nowhere. Where would LAFC be without Carlos Vela? They wouldn't be uh, the supporter shield winner, but they'd probably make the playoffs. Um, and it, it's just a different thing. The Galaxy are nowhere. And we've seen it. We, we've been lucky. We've get to, we get to see these games. And we've seen Zlatan just just grab a game by the scruff of the neck and just dominate it time and time again. Um, that makes him super valuable. Yeah, it, it does. Uh, Opta put out uh, some some stats on Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Again, nothing we didn't know, but it's, again, just trying to quantify that and then looking back over the years to sort of see where that all falls into place. But uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic right now has scored 53.1% of the LA Galaxy's goals this season. That's 26 of 49. Since Opta began tracking such data in 2007, no player has finished the season scoring more than 52.9% of their team's goal. Um, so if you look at that, that means that in 2010, Chris Wondolowski, San Jose Earthquakes, he scored 52.9% 
of the San Jose Earthquakes goals. Uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic currently about two-tenths of a point above that at 53.1% uh, in 2019. Uh, it goes back to, you know, Bradley Wright Phillips at 49.1%, uh, Dom Dwyer in 2014, 45.8%. So uh, there's a lot of different guys in here that uh, that certainly have, have provided and, 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 and sort of scored a lot of goals for their teams for right now. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, uh, Zlatan yeah, that's, Ibrahimovic. That's the point. I mean, you could, if you drew it up, this is not the way you would draw it up. You'd want like five guys scoring all the same amount of goals and a really balanced attack. And that's the way, uh, you know, soccer probably should be played. Um, you know, you should go forward with a lot of attacking options. The Galaxy don't really have that um, option right now. It's everything is going through Zlatan. And you could say, um, well, that's not good and, and we shouldn't do that. And he's a selfish player. You know what? Right now, they're fighting to get in the playoff berth, uh, to get into the playoffs, and they have one guy that can take over a game, and everything's going through him. And if they do get in the playoffs, I don't care if they get in with the last seed by one point, they immediately become favorites or co-favorites with, with a guy like Zlatan that can take over a game at any time. Yeah, it, uh, listen, I think that this game showed a little difference in that, in terms of you know what happened. And I mean, you know, the first goal is created by Antuna, um, certainly. You know, I'm all for it. I don't believe I. I'll disagree with you a little bit in terms of I don't believe that you should have you know five guys all with five goals. That's great if you can do it. That's fine, but that's not. You don't need that. Uh, in my mind, you always need that one guy who's the goal scorer who can lift you up. So you know, really, Zlatan should have like a third or maybe a little bit more of the goals. Maybe he has 35, 40 percent of the LA Galaxy's goals as the striker, as the guy who is leading them, and then you would hope that it would fill in. I would tell you this, I think that if Pavone is on this team from the beginning of this season, that it's not 53.1%. Because you're seeing that one's, one Pavone can definitely score, and I can't believe he didn't score um, against Sporting KC because he had probably three or four really good looks um, at some goals. And, and one was a great save by Tim Melia, who ended up having to make uh, you know a couple saves, and he still let in seven goals. He made six, go- he made six saves, Kevin, and he still gave up seven goals. That's a Five t- in the first half. He was, he was on fire in the first half. In fact, I was kind of writing a running game story because of deadline, and I had a significant chunk of that story about how great he was. Um, and, and I don't think anything changed at halftime. I mean, I, I think, I, I don't know what, obviously something changed for the galaxy. I don't know that Malia had a, a terrible second half. He just didn't stop anything. I don't think most of those goals look at him again. He didn't have a chance. Yeah, there was, there was no chance. I mean, you know, it was some poor defense. Um, I'll, I'll say this. I think sporting Kansas city invited the LA galaxy to counter. There was a really interesting, uh, thing that I saw on the field, and it involved Dave Romney. And I want to start a, a little more discussion, you know, Dave Romney over Jorgen Shelvick and long term, you know, sort of um, what the Galaxy are looking for at left back. But um, one of the things that was this really interesting rotation that Guillermo wanted, and it involved Romney and Pavone. And certainly when you look at how the LA Galaxy midfield was comprised, it was probably more, I know they listed as sort of a 4-3-3, but Antuna and Pavone are more midfielders and wingers in the back there, and Ibrahimovic is more in front of everything, and so if you combine all those things together, um, you sort of get, you know, a a almost five-man midfield with Antuna and Pavone in there. And so there has to be overlapping runs from Felcher, which you saw all night, and he had some good crosses in and played some excellent defense a couple times, made some great runs. I mean, that's something you haven't seen from Felcher. Whatever was going on, the Galaxy were up for this game, um, and they sort of showed it uh, in this. But the the interesting rotation here was this, was and Guillermo you know, was, was shouting about it as soon as it, as soon as the ball would come. And really it was whenever the ball would shift to the left-hand side of the defense. Um, and Diego Polenta would get that because with Felcher pressed up and Romney a little bit more advanced, it's really just Steris and Polenta back there um, with Jonathan Dos Santos able to fill into the center if he needs to. So Polenta would get the ball. As soon as Polenta would get the ball, Guillermo would start shouting at Pavone to cut inside. And so Ibrahimovic would move forward. Pavone would cut almost in underneath him a little bit, although not all the way under him and Romney would rotate forward and get almost all the way up on the line and it was creating movement from sort of these static positions and you saw it over and over and over again it's a simple move I mean it's just a little rotation 
But what it does is it creates an expectation and it opens space. And so, you know, SKC started to create that expectation that the rotation would happen. And then all of a sudden you'd see Pavone not rotate and instead go down the line. And that's when these guys were opening them up, um, opening up to, to find Pavone on the counterattack. Um, you know, I thought Antuna missed a great counterattack, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, opportunity whenever he passed the ball to Ibrahimovic instead of Pavone, who was streaking down the left-hand side. So, I mean, there was a lot of fluid movement between Antuna and Ibrahimovic and Pavone and Felcher and Legette and Dos Santos and Corona and Romney. I mean, there was a lot of moving parts. And for the most part, I thought they stayed pretty patient in the first half. I mean, the goal they gave up in that first half is sort of, you know, a fluky little goal, a, a cross that came in that was not a dangerous cross, um, but made, you know, uh, Dan Steris really have to have to uh, go back and, and play some defense and, and a header that goes out wide, you know, finds, unfortunately, I think it was uh, Gerso and, and he was there and he has the ball and he pushes it in, you know, to uh, to Hurtado or, or to uh, Gutierrez, I think. And so, you know, there was just a little quick breakdown. It was like two passes and, and SKC had the lead in that. But if you look at the rest of the game, in ter- especially in that first half, the Galaxy were pretty patient in terms of launching those counterattacks, and, and Sporting Kansas City was inviting that as well, which is interesting for a team that is on the road. You would think that they would be sitting back and really guarding, and they did. They did have 10 and 11 guys behind the ball sometimes, but the Galaxy still were able to allow them to get forward and then hit, press them on the counterattack, and I think the Galaxy are a better counterattacking team than they are a possession team. So um, just sort of an you know an interesting rotation and an interesting note that you looked at that how Romney sort of fit into that and whether or not you know Shelvick would have fit into that and I think it's a really interesting question Kevin to sort of ask yourself okay Guillermo switched things up here um, he clearly switched things up because he wasn't happy with how the defense performed they gave up one bad goal and a consolation deflection goal that's pretty lucky. Whenever you look at it, uh, David Bingham had to make a couple saves, uh, four total. A couple of those were pretty big. Like I said, I think SKC left two or three goals out there, and it could have easily been, you know, a seven to five game instead of a, a seven to two game. But having said that, the Galaxy defense here played better than we've probably seen them in in recent games, and Guillermo made that switch. So is that is that something he's going to stick with? You think Romney is in the long term future for for the Galaxy? Well, I was just looking at some stats about that, too. Romney's played eight games, but one of them, he only got in for one minute. So you really can't judge him on that. Of the seven games he's played more than one minute, the Galaxy's only lost two. They're four, two, and one. Um, again, going back to what we talked about with Pavone and Giancarlo earlier, what does that mean? I don't know. But certainly they played very well with Romney yesterday and uh, on Sunday. And it, it, the, the, the stats show that he's made a contribution to helping them win all season. I think maybe he is a step above Shelvick right now. And we've seen this the last couple of seasons where something's happened at the end of the year and Romney's had to play. He's very versatile. He can play uh, all four positions in the back line. And the Galaxy, remember last year, they almost made the playoffs. They had that long stretch drive under Dominic Kinnear with, that Romney played a big part in when they paired Romney and Steris in the middle. So I, I think Guillermo may have found something, may have found a good combination um, by putting Romney back on the field. I think he's earned a shot to, to, to maybe continue playing, and we'll see where it goes from there. But it certainly hasn't hurt the, his argument that he deserves to play. And, you know, what Dave's doing right now is, is he has a, a multi-year contract, and he it doesn't look like, you know, with he's played eight games – it doesn't look like he's in the long-term future with the franchise because Guillermo wants to go a different way. So Dave's kind of auditioning for the rest of the league too, and it's a pretty good start to his audition. Yeah, I, you know he's he's had some. One of those games I think was the Atlanta game that he played in, and that's just you know a tough one to come into and and, and try to be uh, anything. The Galaxy haven't had a, a whole but, bunch of success in Atlanta, yeah. but yeah. But you, I just want to say one other thing. I forgot you talked about the Galaxy being a good counterattacking team, and that's really interesting. And it's, it's true, obviously. But it's really interesting, and I think it explains why they played so well against LAFC, and they have. They're unbeaten against LAFC. LAFC is a, definitely a possession team, and that's that's their, that's their how they play defense. They keep the ball away from their opponent, and if the opponent doesn't have the ball, they can't you know, get anything going offensively, and they can't shoot and score, and they can't bring the ball up the field. The Gal- LAFC is very good at winning it back. MLS Cup is going to go through LAFC or through Philadelphia or through Atlanta, all teams who are very possession-oriented, who play that same way, who defend by keeping the ball away from their opponents. If you're a quick a counterattacking team, quick-striking team, like the Galaxy has proven they can be, that can be very effective. 
you're not going to dribble all the way down the field against LAFC, not very often anyways. But if you can do it quickly, as the Galaxy has proven they can do against LAFC, they're going to be very effective. And that's another thing that I think is going to make uh, the Galaxy a dangerous team in the playoffs is that counterattacking uh, uh, ability that they have. Well, when you look at the stats for this SKC team uh, game, it was actually interesting. The Galaxy do have the overall possession, uh, 56.6 to 43.4, so a difference of 13.2%, which is a large margin. Uh, again, looking at the stats, total shots. Uh, the LA Galaxy had 21. Sporting Kansas City had 20. There's a lot of shots in this game. Jeez, 41. Um, you had uh, on-target shots, 13 for the LA Galaxy, 6 for Sporting Kansas City. Uh, whenever you look at chances created, um, excuse me, chances missed, the LA Galaxy had one chance missed. Sporting had four chances missed. Uh, I think here's where the big deal is here, and, and it, I think it starts more in the second half than it does in the first half. Um, but with, between Joe Corona, Jonathan Dos Santos, uh, Sebastian Legette, the duels won. Uh, 65 duels won for the LA Galaxy, 30 duels won for Sporting Kansas City. Uh, that, to me, is the is the big deal. Uh, the Galaxy actually called offside six times, by the way, which is unusual. They normally don't get called offside very often. Um, one of those was a flat-out mistake um, because we saw the replay of it, and, and I, I forget who was attacking. It might have been uh, Antuna, who was actually, or it was Pavone, who was actually onside by a good yard and a half. Um, they called the delayed offside, so it would have, if they would have scored, would have probably come back and VAR would have corrected it. But I don't know how much we're trusting VAR anymore either. Uh, can we talk about this just for a second, Kevin? Just a little bit of the officiating. Certainly the Colorado game, and, and we went over that on Thursday, and we were pretty detailed in that, and you got to hear from the referee, and he gave us a big, long transcript about all these things. But there are two plays in this game which were potential uh, game-changing plays that seem to have been ignored by VAR. Um, certainly one of them. Uh, is, a, is a big red flag, um, and that's the one where uh, where Gu Gutierrez actually trips Zlatan Ibrahimovic in the box. Now, this is one that whenever I saw it live look like Gutierrez may have tripped Zlatan, and you're like, ah, there's probably not that much contact in it. Zlatan when Gutierrez are going at it, you know, a little bit all over the field. So, you know, there's probably not too much in that. Zlatan was embellishing a little bit. Um, then I saw the replay, and I saw Gutierrez just stick his foot out and absolutely trip Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Um, you, if you go on uh, on Twitter, you can certainly see uh, stuff I've retweeted. I've actually seen the entire video and the entire play up to this particular, um, you know, coming together of these two players. And it all starts with Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Ibrahimovic physically dominating Gutierrez off the ball. Uh, Gutierrez is trying to physically push Zlatan around like he's not afraid of him. Whole deal. Um, and Zlatan like pushes him away like he's like he's nothing. Uh, keeps him away from it. And then and they both end up sort of running to the box uh, after this. And Zlatan is going for a cross that looks like it might be coming in. And I don't remember whether or not the ball actually makes it or not um, because the angle of the of the camera is not something I see. But Gutierrez realizing that Zlatan has a good step on him already and is going to be in the box unmarked, sticks out his left foot and trips Zlatan Ibrahimovic in, in a way that you would see in a cartoon uh, more than anything. Zlatan yells at the referee, who in this case, Ted Uncle, to check the video. He's like, ref, check the video. Check the video, ref. He knows it's a foul. He knows it's a penalty kick. Uh, he knows the, the sort of the ramifications of this, and the game wasn't completely out of hand yet. So this is something that you're looking at you know, fairly early in the second half where the LA Galaxy are, are, are looking for calls, um, and VAR doesn't take a look at this. I don't know if they checked it. I don't know if they looked at it and said, ah, there's not much there. Um, but I don't know how you look at the video and conclude that it's not a penalty kick, that it's not a yellow card, um, and that VAR should have gotten involved and helped Ted Uncle make the correct call because he just didn't see it. No, I don't blame Ted Uncle at all for that because he's looking the other way. His back is to Zlatan. The cross was way over Zlatan's head. He would, if, if it was a pass interference call, you'd say it was an uncatchable ball and no foul. But it, it, and, and because it, it cleared Zlatan by quite a distance. But even even if he hadn't gone down, so. But I wonder what does VAR look at? Do they can they look at anything? To, can they look at something like that? When it was wasn't uh, the referee questioning whether you got the call right? Yes. Can yes. you look at something yes, because, off the ball? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's uh, you can look at the you know the four phases, right? Um, basically, it's it's if a goal is scored, if there's a penalty kick, if there's a red card offense, um, and if there is mistaken identity, right? And in this case, it's a penalty kick. 
Um, and, and in fact, it's a blatant penalty kick. It is the easiest penalty kick anybody could ever call, and it's a yellow card. And I thought Gutierrez was on a yellow card already at that point, but apparently he didn't have one, which was surprising because he got into a whole bunch of crazy tackles. Um, you know, Sporting Kansas City lost the plot in the second half and started fouling the LA Galaxy pretty freely for a while there. Um, and so you saw all of these things. Um, so, yeah, they can absolutely check it. And the fact that they don't check it is one of those things that you, you sit there and go, okay, then why have VAR? There's another play that comes about, I think, in the first half. Um, and this is a yellow card on Graham Smith for a tackle on Christian Pavone. Um, now, this particular play is a from-behind challenge, um, and that challenge resulted in basically a scissor tackle that, uh, yeah, it's right before the end of the first half in the 43rd minute. Graham Smith gets a yellow card. Uh, it's from behind on Pavone. It's a scissor tackle. He catches Pavone's left foot in between both of his feet. He twists, and there's a nice little kick out at the right knee after this. Now, looking at it in real time, you sit there and go, okay, that's probably just a tough challenge. You can't see all the details of the challenge, but you're like, okay, that's that's probably a yellow card. But as soon as you see a replay of that, the fact that there are people who are saying, ah, maybe it's not a red card is crazy talk. All right, these are we, we talk about protecting players, and, and I think that MLS and, and Pro certainly have an issue lately with protecting LA Galaxy players. Rolf Felcher got kicked in the head, and the referee called it some contact. As in, yeah, there was some contact, but, you know, it really wasn't anything major. He got kicked in the head, and then you had Christian Pavone go down and get scissor-tackled by Graham Smith, and again, no VAR review. If the VAR official is looking at that and saying, you know, it's not clear and obvious, it's like, you know what, give the center referee a chance to take a look at this. Because in my mind, if Ted Uncle looks at that and sees how the ankle is held in that position and how the scissor comes through and how the kick at the right knee happens as well, how can you sit there and not put a red card? And, and the problem is, and you certainly already see it with MLS, which is hysterical. I'm going to, this is my, I'll, I'll finish my rant here in a second, but you already see this with MLS, which is, which is fairly hysterical. You know, the, the big show that, that gets all of the, uh, all, all of the views is the instant replay show that, that they do. The MLS puts out, um, that's guys going over, uh, you know, it, it's Bobby Warshaw and Andrew Weeby going over, you know, plays, um, that are controversial and they're giving their opinions on it. And whether you, you agree with their opinions, which most of the time I don't because they're not based on any particular set of laws uh, that, that soccer actually follows, but whether you watch that or not, there was no video from Instant Replay that I saw from either the Colorado game, which had the most controversial calls because it absolutely changed the outcome of a match. There was no video from that in their Instant Replay. Uh, however, they did argue about a throw-in that somebody had at midfield and whether or not that was an issue. Um, so there was nothing from the Colorado game and probably because of the lateness. So I'll give them a little bit that the East coast lateness, the Sunday night game starting at seven o'clock, there was nothing from this game as well. Um, this sporting Kansas city game. And it was, you know, lateness and also probably the score, a seven to two. Nobody's going to pay attention to these referee mistakes. Whenever the score is seven to two, but the galaxy have been, fairly frequently in the last two or three games and probably throughout a lot of these games been getting pretty unfairly, I think, uh, 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 targeted with, with not getting VAR calls. And these have been very obvious calls. Well, I like the way Sebastian Legette handled that when, when we talked to him last week and he said, talking about the Colorado game, he said, yeah, there were mistakes made, probably could have gone the other way, probably should have been reviewed. But then he said, we should never have let it come down okay, to that. Okay, that's and, and, let's argue, let's talk about that for a second because I hear fans say the same thing. And in, in my opinion, just and I'll let you finish because I don't want to completely derail this, but in my opinion, that's a great sort of soundbite. That's like, hey, we just take it one game at a time. You know, we shouldn't put ourselves in that position. The bottom line is the Galaxy were in a position to win that game without those calls. Or they were at least in a position to draw that game without those calls. And being those calls went against them, it did not help them, did not do it. And their obvious and clear errors that the referees made, they didn't draw that game. And they didn't get the win. And so we can say, don't put yourself in the position, but the Galaxy actually put themselves in a position to get points out of those games. And the referees, with bad officiating, took those away. So I, I get it. Because that's the excuse that I hear from fans, and that's the excuse I hear from players, but it's not an accurate representation of what is actually happening on the field. 
Well, I don't think it's an excuse. What he's saying is we, we as players, we need to take the responsibility and not wait for a referee to make a decision one way or the other to help us. We need to dominate the game to a degree where the referee is insignificant. And you're the one who's the close personal uh, email buddy with with Howard Webb. So you <laughs> yes. know, maybe you got to yeah. talk to him about this. But <laughs> I, I've seen a couple things with referees this summer and, and instant replay. At the Women's World Cup, it, there was definitely a sense in my mind, and I know some of the numbers will show differently, that the center referees were all looking over their shoulders. Anything close, they wanted to stop the game and take a look because they felt like they were going to be criticized by FIFA. They really felt like they were under the microscope. The men's World Cup wasn't the same. I didn't get the same feeling. But the women's World Cup, they would, I definitely felt that the center referees were extremely tentative and didn't really take control of the game because of that. And I, I, I don't think they were all well-officiated games because everyone felt like they were going to be second-guessed. In MLS, I think it's a different thing. Um, I, I think the referees don't want to be second-guessed. They feel like we're in charge. And maybe they hear it in the ear piece. Hey, you might, might want to take a look at that. And it's like, no, no, I got it. I got it. I'm, I'm in charge here. Um, and, and I do think that hurts the game. I think that there needs to be a little bit, maybe there needs to, maybe the, the center referee and the, the VAR official, maybe they need to have teams where they work together on a regular basis so they get to have some chemistry between one another and they get to trust one another. Because I do feel that the referees now, they see it as a sign of weakness if they decide to take a look at a replay like I missed it the first time. And, and you know, I do think that's one of the things, but, and I'm going to get way out here and, and piss a lot of people off with this one but when you look at any call there's two teams playing in a game and so you look at the game and i i totally agree with you in the colorado game i think the first one the 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 uh, penalty kick the call against the uh, for colorado in the penalty box there was no contact there if anything that was a dive that should not have been a penalty kick i can go either way on the Ralph felcher play i, I the referee said both people were competing for the ball one guy dick ducked his head Ralph ducked his head the other player used his foot um I can see where – I'm not saying I agree with this call, but I can see where that call is. And, and But then you go back to the first LAFC game where people say that that's a lot – the ga Galaxy fans look at that and say, no, definitely not, didn't happen, don't see it. I don't know how you can make that call. LAFC fans look at that and say, oh, it was absolutely – it was a street mugging. That's a felony. He should be in jail. <laughs> I, there are a lot of calls that you look at that, and, and you if you see it with your sort of fan eyes – it definitely looks one way. The referee can't can't see it that way. And I'm not saying any of these calls were that way. I thought the trip in the box against Salatan was pretty clear, although it was hard to I, – I, I would imagine for Ted Uncle it was impossible to see in real right. time, right. especially since he's looking the other way. But that is a case where a VAR – can slow that down and take a look at it. And it was very clear and it was intentional. And the thing is you can't on that one, you can't argue that, Oh, that was incidental contact. The player was making a move for the ball. He was going the other way. He clearly stuck his foot out and turned and ran away. Yeah, he, he did. And and here's the, the thing I get into and something I've been thinking about all day, because, you know, I'm sitting here going, you know, it was pretty obvious uh, fairly quickly, at least in the press box, that we were looking at something, we saw the replay, and we like, okay, there's something there. It wasn't that we knew the answer, because we couldn't see the replay that fast, and the TV isn't that close that I can go, you know, sit there, and I don't jump up and stand in front of the TV to see the replays. I'm still looking at it from a little distance, so I'm like, okay, there looks like there's something there. And, and that's sort of my question. Are we asking VAR to not miss anything? Because they're missing things left and right. Um, and, you know, hey, even whenever the referee goes and looks at the monitor, like you said, in the Colorado game, there's no guarantee he's going to see it the way that everybody else in the stadium sees it. Um, and quite honestly, everybody else sees it according to the laws of the game. Um, there's no guarantee. But, I mean, the, the deal is that you know that there's something there. And it only takes you a couple seconds to call down to Ted Uncle and say, hey, delay this for a second. I just need to check something. I don't think it's anything. But let me just take a look. And then you see the camera. It takes you about 10 seconds to realize, oh, wait, wait, there is something here. Stay, now, now I really want you to delay. I need to take a much closer look at this. Possible penalty kick. I'm reviewing this. And so then the VAR official up there goes and looks at the cameras real quick and goes, yeah, Ted, listen. There was something behind it. Gutierrez absolutely trips Zlatan Ibrahimovic. You can look at it if you want, 
but I'm telling you, clear and obvious air, Gutierrez yellow card, and a penalty kick awarded to Los Angeles. And that's all it is. It doesn't take that long. And I feel like that they're, they're afraid to look at these things. There's no other side of some of these things. Um, that one is blatant, and it's the easiest one to make the argument for. Um, you know, I would say the, the, the sort of the most borderline call that was made on the night was the Matt uh, Beasler handball that ended up being, you know, the first LA Galaxy, or the, yeah, the first LA Galaxy, the game tying goal uh, in that first half, the 1 1, uh, for Zlatan Ibrahimovic and his penalty kick. It's a handball, but you could sit there and look at You had to look at it for a little while in order to determine whether or not that was a handball, and they looked at it, and they determined it, and they got it right with VAR. That is the most borderline call that was made on the night. The rest of them seem like they're pretty obvious in terms of the tackle on Graham Smith, um, and again, this this in the, in the, in the box. It's not an excuse for the LA Galaxy, but you can certainly see um, that there, there tends to be, and somebody accused me of saying that, you know, the referees are conspirators. And I'm like, no, 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 they're not conspiring with each other. They're human beings. And I feel like that Zlatan going out there and calling them horrible at their job every chance he gets, which, by the way, I don't necessarily know that he's wrong, um, you know, doesn't exactly fit very well with them. And then you have situations like this where you look and you see Zlatan get tripped in the ball and all the referees sort of be like, oh, no, we never saw it. Um, well, I... Back at the start of your soliloquy about a half hour ago, you started with a question and you said, um, you know, is is VAR not being used correctly or is it are we asking the referees to do too much? And the lion, a.k.a. God, answered that for you a couple of weeks ago. Maybe it was a couple of months ago when he talked about VAR and he said, look, we back in the day when there was no VAR, we knew the referees were going to make certain amount of errors. We make certain amount of errors as a player. And you just factored that in and you were able to get on with the game. But Zlatan's point was we have VAR now. We have a camera on every play, so we shouldn't miss anything. Um, and they do miss things. And, and I do think part of it, I don't have any evidence for this, it's just a hunch. I do think part of it is the human nature. I do think some referees are more apt to take a look and others don't want to be second-guessed. And when baseball started instant replay several years ago, I remember talking to an umpire, Alfonso Marquez, and my thought was, you guys don't want people looking over your shoulders, right? You're not going to want to use this instant replay. You hate this. You, you know, this is big brother. And his response was, no, we want to get the calls right. We think we're really good. And we think the cameras are going to show that we welcome this. And if we get something wrong, that was a really surprising response to me. And I'm not sure that the MLS referees have gotten to that point yet where they say, all we want to do is get it right. Uh, we don't look at the cameras as a fixing blame and telling us we're bad you know, we missed it. Another thing too, I think that that's something that might want to be looked at, and this is an even bigger change of the game probably than VAR. I think the the players are too big and too fast and the ball moves too quickly for one, one referee. I know there's sideline referees and they help a little bit, but I wonder if we should go to the NBA system and add another referee now. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's been, I certainly think that might help, um, you know, and, and it's all about angles and how it looks. I mean, you know, there's certainly an argument in the Colorado game that because the game was on local cable and because, you know, it was Altitude Sports, which is currently in a uh, an argument with, I, I believe it's Dish Network, and they're not even getting it, that there weren't that many cameras at the game. And really, we only had, you know, two angles of the Shinyashiki sort of flop that there was no contact. And because of that, there's not enough evidence to sort of look at and say, oh, whether or not that was good or bad. Um, so, you know, if, if it, you, there's some arguments there, but you, you saw the Portland game over the weekend, you had a ball that went over the line, but did it go over the line? And the only reason that you can e even really have that argument is because ESPN was doing the national televised game and the galaxy fans know this, that ESPN has the goal line, uh, the, the goal post cameras on each goal post. Um, and they're the only ones that have that camera. And so you're able to see it. And, you know, Taylor Twellman posted a photo of, of a ball showing it over the line. You're like, well, that's clear and obvious. And then you go to the other goal, goal cam, uh, goal post cam on the other side, and it doesn't look obvious. And you're sitting there going, how is there a difference between this and the goal line technology debate, which, uh, you know, I think at this point, MLS needs to spend the money and be do use goal line technology. Um, you know, this that solves that debate pretty easily. And, and it goes through the whole thing. Well, yes. One of the things you just you mentioned with the camera angles, and you talked about the beginning when you said angles are so important when we talked about adding perhaps a second center referee, um, that angles are very important. I, I actually went to umpire school, Major League Baseball umpire school one one year. Um, not to become an umpire, but to do a story on it. And that's one of the things the umpire said is you don't want to get close to the play. That's not important. You needed the angle to see the play. 
Uh, and angles are so important. Sometimes a referee can be 25 yards away and ha- actually be in perfect position to make the call. And sometimes he can be right on top of the play and miss it completely. It's really the angle and the vision that you have. Uh, and that's why sometimes you get those two cameras looking at the same thing and it's a totally different result. Well, well it was interesting because I was talking with another reporter uh, late last night after we were sort of talking about VAR and how it works. And, you know, he's like, it, we, he said, you know, it should be mandated how many cameras are in each stadium because you're gaining advantages or disadvantages by either having a nationally televised game with ESPN and getting the advantage of that or, you know, not having a nationally televised game and you have a local broadcast that only has six cameras where ESPN has 12 cameras and they have all the angles and they do all those things. It's like there has to be some uniformity to this. Otherwise, you're getting ra- you're adding randomness or not even randomness, but, you know, just straight up disadvantage to some teams or advantage to some teams with that randomness of absolutely you you mentioned colorado so you have a rinky dink cable outlet out there with a with a guy holding an old uh you know hang hand cranked camera right and that, that's what you're using for replays and then you got an espn game that's why major league baseball the nfl they all mandate the, the not only the number of cameras but the camera angles and in a big international event like the w- world cup or the women's world cup FIFA manages all the cameras. There, there is not an independent broadcast. There are several cameras, but the point is FIFA mandates all of the views where the cameras are, the positions of the cameras. So if you have a game in the round of 16 versus a game in the first round in different stadiums, you get the exact same view. And you know what? You know who that helps? The video assistant referee yes. because he knows where to go to get the angle that he wants. Absolutely. See, we're fixing problems like crazy. They should just hire us to fix all these well, problems that they have. You and Howard are buddy buddy. Just send him an email. <laughs> hey, it was forwarded. Okay, so I'm once removed from being friends with with you Howard Webb. You should tell Webb. people. You should tell people. I'm once removed about. from from Howard Webb. That's what I said. Yeah. No, you, oh. that you sent him an email and but, that uh, that you guys are buddies now. I'm sure. I, I, do people know this story? Yeah, they do. I told it on okay. uh, on Thursday night how uh, after the game, I, I actually, you know, Bazakos, who was the, the referee in Colorado, I actually complimented him. I know people think that that's crazy, but I complimented him because he gave basically a full interview after the game. Uh, Matt Pollard, who was the other pool reporter uh, in Colorado, uh, got that interview and did a great job. Matt was awesome, gave him a whole bunch of props. But, I mean, Bazakos did what every referee should do. I mean... I'll be honest with you. We were ready with pool reporter questions for the tackle on Smith. Um, And given the time, if the game still would have been close, we probably would have added the Zlatan one with Gutierrez. But because of the scoreline, 7-2, to and because of all the work that everybody has to do after these games, adding something else in there... It, you know, it ended up not affecting the game, so it's not as a, a big of a story. That's that's a lazy answer, by the way. I'm not exactly pleased with myself for not going ahead and finding out what the answer is, or kind of regardless of what the score is. But those are the realities sometimes of how it was. As it was, I got to I got to bed at 2 a.m. Uh, this morning, I guess was oh, early. Out. Yeah, early, I know, right? Early morning. But here's the deal with a referee in any sport: um, wh- what you want from them is you want an answer. You, you want them to say, "Here's what I saw." Here's where I why I made the call. And if they agree with the call, here's why I, I think I got it right. And if they mess up, you want them to say, I totally messed that up. I'm sorry. I was at the in the wrong angle. I I thought I saw it right, but now that I see the replay, I clearly got it wrong. That that's all players, coaches, journalists. That's what we want from uh, the officials because any player, any journalist, any coach will admit they make a lot of mistakes too. It, it's it's again, it's the it's not the it's not the crime. It's the cover up. You know, if you just say, look, I blew it. I missed it. I'm sorry. I, I'll, I'll try to bear down next time. I think everyone will walk away maybe disappointed if you lose a big game. But with a little bit of respect for the official for owning up to the mistake or at least explaining why he didn't see the call the way you saw it. Yeah. Um, but it's when they start saying, like, oh, don't even question me. I got this right. You know, I don't need to look at the video replay. And we've heard that before. I don't need to look at the replay. Oh, I think you ought to look at the replay because clearly you had no clue what you were doing. Well, it was the Shinyashiki one was, oh, it's a tripping foul. It was easy, is what Bazako says. And it's like, wow, you know, maybe if you give him a chance to look at the uh, at the video, he sits there and goes, oh, okay, that wasn't so, that's not an easy call at all, actually. I'm not sure there was any contact there, but he never looked at it. So, of course, he would think it was easy. In his mind, he saw what he saw. So, uh, that's all, that, you know, again. Again, sidetrack. A 7-2 game. The Galaxy score seven goals, the most since 1998 when they beat, uh, let's see, it was FC Dallas at FC Dallas. 
um, at the Cotton Bowl, I believe. Uh, it was an 8-1 to victory um, in 1998. By the way, within a month, uh, a month earlier, they had beat the Colorado Rapids at home 7-4 to in 1998. So that was a seven-goal game as well. Um, so the LA Galaxy, uh, you know, 7-2, to a five-goal difference and a five-goal margin of victory, uh, whenever you look at it, also means, Kevin, that they went into the game as a minus five goal differential, right? And they now exited that game with an even goal differential, with a zero. In fact, they almost had a plus one. They almost went from minus five to plus one uh, whenever you uh, whenever you looked at it. But they're at a zero goal differential, which could come into play whenever you look at tiebreakers and a whole bunch of other things. It might not, um, but it's one of those things that uh, the, running up the score against Sporting Kansas City was much needed for LA Galaxy, who uh, who now have an even goal differential after being in minus category for, for quite a while well, now. Here's another stat. Seven goals yesterday, right? Yep. The Galaxy did not score seven goals combined in the month of May or in the month of June or in the month of July. Oh, see? I mean, it's it, it's sort of like the floodgates open. You you almost wonder whether or not, and, and I try to think, you know, do you trust this team? And the answer is no. Um, no, you celebrate this win. And this is incredible. We should celebrate this win. We should talk about how great it was. Watching Zalatan, you're never going to see anything like that again. Yada, yada, yada. You know what? They could go out and they could lose to Montreal, Montreal. 4 to nothing. Well, and uh, we yeah, yeah. We, we wouldn't be surprised, no. right? Because this is the way they've been all season. No, we wouldn't be surprised. Uh, in that Montreal game, Rolf Felcher will be suspended. He picked up a yellow card and was on yellow card watch. Uh, so he will not be in there, which likely more means... More Dave Romney. More Dave Romney. Probably also, I'm guessing, Julian Araujo um, might slot in on that right-hand side. I imagine that Guillermo keeps things relatively untouched. Uh, Fabio Alvarez, Guillermo said afterwards, is about uh, anywhere between 10 to 14 days out. Uh, it's some sort of calf strain or calf injury and whenever uh, I was pressed with which leg the calf was, I was told it was either the left or the right. That was actually me saying that because I didn't ask, but it was definitely the left or the right leg. It was uh, one of those. One of the two. One of the two. I'm almost. 50% chance of getting it right. Yeah, I was, I'm was. i 80% certain it's definitely the left or right leg. It's it's one of those. So um, we might see Alessandrini. Alessandrini sighting. Yeah, I know. Guillermo keeps trying to push him up i think that uh allison drini talked to larry morgan not on twitter um earlier this week and said you know he was sort of targeting that rsl game so in my mind i'm thinking rsl is is probably the still likely return um for ramon allison Drini. but if it's early and it's against montreal then uh you know it is what it is the galaxy still um have four games remaining if i'm uh if i'm correct, correct. yeah absolutely uh montreal on september 21st so a whole week this is the only week off this was one of the things that i was sort of saying whenever you you told uh tweeted out about the party that zlatan's holding i'm like do it now because the galaxy's schedule goes like just gets just shrinks after this game because you got saturday playing against montreal you got wednesday at rsl which is probably which is the toughest remaining game on their schedule out of these last four games uh then it's home the net that following sunday to vancouver and then one week after that, it is away to Houston. So the time to party is right now, is today, because they're back at training, uh, and the training schedule shows them training all throughout the week uh, for the well, remainder of the week. Let me ask you something. Are you think there's a lot of players in that locker room saying, darn it, we should be in Las Vegas playing in that League's Cup final? Can you imagine that? That's I just again, you know, we we talked about that so many times, and I know people were some people were rolling their eyes saying, "Hey, you win every game that you can win." Could could you imagine if the LA Galaxy were currently, you know, getting ready to travel on Tuesday to Las Vegas to go play in the League's Cup final? And we the, know they're not going to take a lot of time. They're not going to take Pavon. How do they're you not, not do? Take, how do you know, not? How how do you not do that, Kevin? That's well, my I, question. I certainly don't think you you take a lot of time. But but let's just let's just say I'm right for once, and that they don't take their their star lineup, that they take a mix like they played in the other games. Let's just say I'm right. Um, it, it still takes it still disrupts training. Someone has to tr to travel. The coaching staff has to travel. The coaching staff can't prepare for the next game, so it, it's a detriment either uh, in that way. If you're right and they take everybody. Then, then it's a complete disaster because now you're in the middle of fighting for trying to get in the MLS Cup playoffs. Hey, you know what? Next week, who next week people won't remember who won the League's Cup or what the score was, but they will remember who won the MLS Cup. So the idea, I get the idea of you got a chance to win some silverware, go out and do it. But really, the focus at this point needs to be on getting into the MLS playoffs. And if they were in that League Cup, I think that would be uh, th that would take their focus away from the business at hand. 
uh, LA Galaxy did jump three teams. The results really went their way. FC Dallas, Portland, San Jose Earthquakes all lost their games. Uh, the LA Galaxy then with the win jumped all three of those players, which shuffled FC Dallas out of the playoffs currently. Uh, they're in eighth spot with 43 points. Portland Timbers in seventh spot with 43. San Jose Earthquakes with 44, just one point behind the LA Galaxy who have 45 points. Just one point ahead of the Galaxy, Real Salt Lake at 46. Minnesota United is three points ahead of the Galaxy at 48 points and then the Seattle Sounders sit at 49 points, LAFC at 64, having already clinched the number one playoff seed there in the conference um, and uh, already the playoff spot. But other than that, only the Vancouver Whitecaps have been eliminated from postseason play in the Western Conference. Only FC Cincinnati has been eliminated from postseason play in the Eastern Conference. Three teams in the Western Conference have already locked up a playoff spot. Um, although they haven't clinched positioning, New York City FC, Philadelphia Union, and Atlanta United all have their playoff spots locked in. In the Western Conference, only one team, LAFC, is locked into the playoffs. The rest, Seattle, Minnesota, Real, Salt Lake, LA Galaxy, San Jose Earthquakes, Portland Timbers, FC Dallas, are all still battling for the remaining six spots in that Western Conference. But you know, you know who's done? I mean, realistically, I mean, I, Sporting I know Kansas City. We, we talk about the Galaxy, they're on the bubble and they need to get going and all that. But I really think Dallas is done because not only in the first tiebreaker is victories and they have 12. They're what two behind the Galaxy, um, but their schedule coming up, they go to Seattle. They play New York FC, New York City FC, uh, which is the best team in the Eastern Conference at home. Then they go to Colorado. You look at that, you see the, the way the Galaxy just struggled. That's a trip to altitude. Robin Frazier's got that team playing really well. That's not a gimme. And then they finish with Sporting Kansas City. I think they have three, three and a half at least real tough games coming up. And and they're in bad shape with, uh, in, in regards to the tiebreaker. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't work well for them. You know, ultimately the the loss to the LA Galaxy probably sealed Sporting Kansas City's fate as well. Um, but they're they're not that they're they're really not they're only six points out of really a playoff spot when you look at it um, whether or not they can have the tiebreaker if you look at it they'll put them at 12 wins so I mean they're not completely out of it but the way that they lost to the Galaxy it feels like they're out of it Colorado feels like they're probably out of it Houston is out of it um, so it's just a matter of time ticking down for those the LA Galaxy though like we said um, have a, have the ability and have the chance to you know uh, again extend and, and move further into the safety of the playoffs depending on what the results are around the league and where everybody plays um you know the galaxy could jump up as high as uh you know really third place um possibly even just right behind seattle depending on you know the results that go down and, and how that all happens but you know that's a, that's another thing that we'll be watching this weekend kevin is watching the results of everybody again uh just like the galaxy were doing uh and and sebastian Lejet said after the game he was like yeah he goes we know all the results went our way he goes it's something we tried not to think about but we knew that all those teams had lost and then if we won that we would jump over them and, and be back in the playoffs and so you know these guys pretend like they don't watch the scoreboard they're all watching the scoreboard they pretend like they don't read the press they all read the press you know um all this stuff is, is you know our, our certainties with how this goes and whenever you're down the stretch now four games remaining for the la galaxy um you know they have one of the easier schedules whenever you look at these remaining four games and their positioning right now tends to put them in that position 538 before this game kevin had them an 80 percent chance to make the playoffs um, I still feel like that's probably a pretty accurate representation of where they are, but knowing this LA Galaxy team, it's been high, low, high, low. Every time you think they've figured it out, they indeed have not yet figured it out. Well, uh, I, I don't know that they read the press. I don't think they even know who I am. Um, but the the idea of trying to get into the top four spots to have that home field uh, first-round playoff game, Galaxy are 10-4-1 and one at home and 4-9-2 and two on the road. Um, so it, it does mean a lot if they try to if they were able to get that home field advantage, and then if they were able to, if they finish in, in the four or five spot, and they win, then I believe they would play LAFC uh, in the conference semifinals, which would be essentially another home game. I know it's at Bank of California, but the point is they don't have to travel. Um, so, you know, that would be a benefit to them as well. Well, the LA Galaxy now have uh, with still let's see two home games remaining. The LA Galaxy have 31 points at home in 2019. In 2018, they had just 28 points. In 2016, 
they had 32 points. 2017, they only had 14 points, so I skipped over that. Um, but really, when you look at their historical average across all of their seasons, uh, right around 31 points is sort of the average. Um, so the LA Galaxy are, are, are a very average home team right now. And as a matter of fact, uh, when you look at all the total points and where they sit as well, it, it's again, it's about another average LA Galaxy team right now. They have 45 points through 30 games. And if you look at the averages from the rest of those, it's about 44.85 is the average. So um, not the not a great LA Galaxy team uh, compared to all the other ones, but it certainly seems like they are an average LA Galaxy team. And certainly with the talent they have, I think an average team can become a dangerous team in the MLS Cup playoffs. So um, I think that's it. Do you, you have anything else? I, I didn't, you know, I didn't mean to go off on the complete tangent with the referees there, but it's it's something that wouldn't get talked about because of the scoreline, and that shouldn't be fair. Um, yeah, when you and your buddy Howard get together, he's gonna he's gonna you up. He's he's gonna but, come uh, over for drinks. It's gonna I, be great. I, yeah, I, I guess my my last thing would be, you know, it was an incredible game. It, it was a, it was a real showcase for Zlatan, and we really see that chemistry between him and Pavon. But they haven't won back to back games since mid April, and I just I have a bad feeling about Montreal. That's the, the a game that they should definitely win. Um, and they and if they do, they really build up momentum going forward. And and uh, you know if Dallas were to lose, it would just about lock up a playoff spot or certainly put them in great position. But they've been so inconsistent. You just don't know what you're going to get. You talked about the starting lineup with Romney probably being in there and maybe Rahul. Do you think that's a lot time guy will get another start? Yeah, I, th- I think so. I, I think here here's uh, you know all jokes aside about Zlatan, I find it so difficult to 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 place him in my mind of how good he is. Um, I watch it, and it has become almost normal to watch him do the things that he does. Um, You know, his second goal, I think, that he scored was a ball that Rolf Felcher kind of hit behind him, and it came to his right foot, and he shifted his weight quickly. And, you know, Graham Smith sort of just almost fell over in his shoes from how quickly this 37-year-old, almost 38-year-old, shifted directions and went around him. And it's just it's poor defending, but it's also – incredible athleticism uh, the ball gets stuck under his feet and he's still able to get sort of left footed underneath it and, and knock it in I mean you know Zlatan missed his first penalty kick of his MLS career because he was 10 of 10 until that and he ended up being 10 of 11 but in true Zlatan style Kevin uh, he gets credit for a full goal now instead of a penalty kick goal so you know he can sit there and say hey you know not all my goals are penalty kicks and that one counted as a not penalty kick he finished it up he cleaned it up and he, and he still scored um, it's just the incredible things that he does. And, you know, Robbie Keane, Robbie Keane made some things look easy and effortless and, and he always works so hard. So there was always that indication that he was working hard and, and he had those smooth moments where you were like, oh, he just faked that guy out of his shoes. And, you know, that guy's, that guy's a family and that's, that's embarrassing. But with Zlatan, I, I find it difficult to, to place him in how good he is. And I look at the numbers and I look at the stats and I go over it and over it again. And everything tells me he is one of the best major league soccer players to have ever played this game. And he's, well, he just said he is I, the best. I, he, I, and, and it's, I, listen, you, you, you said it. Are you sick of the, are you sick of the act sometimes? I'm like, yeah, I'm sick of the act, but that wasn't an act from him. And I heard him say it and I said, Oh, I'm going to have to check on that and sort of see it. And, it's it's not I, I don't think it's Homer of us. We get we have we have had the privilege to watch him so much that it almost is expected and that's sort of what I'm trying to get over in my head is that I've seen him do the things that he can do, Kevin, and I've seen him do it to, to good players in Major League Soccer. And within the reference frame of Major League Soccer, he dominates everybody that he plays, and it's expected that he dominates. So when he doesn't dominate, it's almost the story. When he what? doesn't score a goal, it's a story. Which is crazy. Goals are hard to score. You know what he he, when I see him play, I I just think he's so physically strong. He just manhandles opponents. It's kind of like LeBron James, you know, the way he plays basketball, and then Carlos Vela, um, you know, the other MVP uh, MVP candidate. He's kind of like Seth Curry. You know, he's a very technical, very gifted athlete, but but does dominates the game in a totally different way. They're two they're two great athletes, and frankly, that's what makes El Trafico so awesome. Is they both I believe have eight goals in the five games, 
and they've they've come in different ways. And to watch them go head to head, it's like watching you know a, a, a fighter who's a jab guy against a guy who throws hard punches. Um, so a lot of times, just physically, just physically dominates other players. And I, uh, you, you're right. It, when game is on the line, everyone looks to Zlatan, and the opponents, and the Galaxy. Right. And that that might be the one Achilles heel. And speaking of Achilles. Salatan didn't train last week and hasn't trained regularly for a while because the Achilles that kept him out at the beginning of the season is now starting to hurt him a little bit. And in fact, one of us, I'm not going to say which one and you or I, which one it was, worried that perhaps he wouldn't play in the game on Sunday because of the Achilles and the fact that he hadn't trained. But I'm getting to wonder now, Zlatan has played soccer his whole life. He knows how to play soccer. Uh, he's played probably close to what, 800 games at least, probably more. He knows how to play soccer. He doesn't need to train every day right. like uh, like Efren Alvarez does. And maybe the idea that he's sitting out and, stay, and going into the gym and not running around on the field um, every day to rest his Achilles, at least that's the theory, you know, that, that that may be really working for him because he seems rested. You talked about yesterday, someone was talking about, well, they're up 7-1, to one, get Zlatan off the field. Uh, that he was hasn't me. come out of the game all year. Yeah, that was I, I was saying, I was like, get him off the field. I go, hey, listen, it won't happen, but get him off the field. Because as you said, he's played 90 minutes every single game this year. And so, so this idea of resting the Achilles and not training and not beating himself up, um, it seems to be working. Maybe this is a formula for the future. Anyone over 34 doesn't have to train during the week. You know, it's not <laughs> there. Uh, it's interesting that 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 I mean, under Bruce Arena, when he had some of the veterans like, you know, David Beckham, like Landon Donovan, they were guys who he was like, yeah, you don't need to. And Bruce was very much a if you don't train, you don't play guy. Um, but he also knew that there were some guys who you're like, yeah, you don't need to train today. You know, take it easy. Go inside. You're done. And, and you need to rest and, and sort of that. And that's locked on for right now. I mean, you know, uh, somebody was trying to say, you know, oh, well, you definitely sign him for another year. You know, his health isn't going to be an issue. And I'm just like, his health is already an issue. He's been dealing with an Achilles. He doesn't train all the time. Uh, he's almost 38 years old. I mean, he's done all these amazing things, but you can't say that health is not an issue. It has absolutely impacted the way he's played. Um, that being said, it just hasn't impacted him enough to not have now the LA Galaxy single season goal scoring record at 26 goals and have the uh, and to be just five goals away from tying the all time MLS uh, record for a single season that Joseph Martinez set uh, last year. Um, so you could see Zlatan go after that. You could see Zlatan go after the Golden Boot. All these things are possible in Zlatan land, and I find it's difficult to say that Zlatan couldn't do this or couldn't do that. Uh, he seems to be the guy who can do anything. So uh, next time, if you think there's any limitations on how many goals he can score and what he can do in these remaining four games, uh, I would say that there are there are no limitations on that. He could score another 10 goals in the next four games, and I would not be surprised. But again, it's the Galaxy. He could also score one goal, and we'd not be surprised by that either. Nope, not at all. All right, LA Galaxy have a weekend match, so no midweek game, which is good for all of us. We all get to take a little bit of break. Spend some time with your family instead. That sounds like fun. Um, I have a family? No, you, not you. Oh, Other okay. people. Um, so you could you could do that. Uh, the Galaxy game coming up this weekend uh, against Montreal Impact on Saturday. So that's one of those you're going to want to make sure that you're ready for. Um, should be an interesting game, as, as Kevin certainly highlighted. We're going to get you ready for that game on Thursday night with our live show. So make sure you check that out, 7 p.m. on uh, our live page. Just go to cornerofthegalaxy.com and click the live page. So again, Saturday, September 21st, the 7.30 p.m. kickoff time. This game on Spectrum Sportsnet coming up on Saturday. We'll have a full preview for it and get you caught up on all the rest of the LA Galaxy news that has come out between Monday and Thursday on that Thursday show. All right, uh, Mr. Kevin Baxter, anything else? I think that does it. Uh, good, because we, we've talked way too long. For It was the seven. There were a lot of goals. There were seven goals. I had to go back and watch a video in order to explain all the goals in my recap because there were too many goals. All right. There was nine, actually. There were nine. Well, seven for the Galaxy, nine. Yeah, and the okay. two. Yes, I got it. Okay. Yeah, I can do math. That's fine. All right. If you're looking for Mr. Kevin Baxter on Twitter, please follow him at kbaxter11. And, of course, uh, head on over to latimes.com where you can find all of his soccer reporting including covering all the teams here in Southern California, the U.S. men's national team, the women's national team, basically any soccer that impacts here in Southern California or around the nation. Kevin's usually that guy there 
at the LA Times. If you're looking for me on Twitter, it's at Jay Gessman, J-G-U-E-S-M-A-N, and of course, at Galaxy Podcast. Reminds you to head over to our t-shirt. Uh, if you go to the shop on cornerofthegalaxy.com, you can find our t-shirt just available until Wednesday. So they close on Wednesday. You're going to want to get them. $22 gets you a, a wonderfully designed shirt, I think, and helps support us here at the podcast. All right, for Mr. Kevin the Panda Baxter, I'm Josh Pato Gessman, and you've been listening to Corner of the Galaxy from the Box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. You've been listening to the Corner of the Galaxy from the Box podcast on cornerofthegalaxy.com. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Galaxy Podcast. And be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. And for all of your independent LA Galaxy news, discussion, and entertainment, including this podcast, head on over to cornerofthegalaxy.com. Fans, thanks for listening. We ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Until then, I'm Michael Araujo, and on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, goodbye, everyone.